Okay, folks, this is your one-minute warning. Uh, we'll get ready to get started and see what we can do. Used to it. <laughs> I, I now have questions. <laughs> oh, that's a practice. It's not fair for him to do it. Kevin was sitting there for a long time. He didn't ask him anything. So Grout has a long Okay, folks, good evening and welcome to the August 7th edition of the Albuquerque City Council. Uh, a few housekeeping matters. Councilor Jones will be excused this evening. Uh, all other councilors are present with Councilor uh, Benton attending via Zoom shortly. Uh, as we do always, uh, we have a few housekeeping rules. Um, but first, we will begin with a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance uh, to be uh, led by counselors uh, designated by our Vice President. I would ask uh, folks in your moment of silence this evening uh, to think about and remember uh, our former colleague and City Councilor Ruth Adams, uh, who passed away this past uh, week. She served in this council for eight years, two terms, I think, back in the late 90s and did a great job in this seat in District 6 and for our city. She passed away. We want to remember her. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Councillor Lewis, would you lead us um, in English and Councillor Pena in Spanish, please? Thank you. Civic part, uh, civic, excuse me, Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the near table at the cham chamber entrance. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view these, this meeting in person and on live streams through four different platforms. Gov TV on Comcast Channel 16, the Gov TV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. The live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable the closed captioning services on your television or device at this time. The video recording of this and all past council meetings will remain available for viewing at any time on the City Council's website. Council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 505-768-3100 for assistance during business hours Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. The Council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening if needed. With regard to decorum in the chambers, we want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not um, make any personal attacks and please no applause or outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we are respectful of one another. Okay, we're going to move on to proclamations and presentations. Councillor Pena. Okay. Did you find it? Okay. 
So we have a presentation from Artemis Productions regarding the Lowrider Super Show, Mr. Joe Romero, Romero and Lorenzo Otero and Julia um, Pumler will be presenting an award to council. And as you're coming up to the podium, I just really want to thank you guys for all the work that you're doing with the Lowrider Conference. You know, I, I don't think we did it this year, but Jeff has always done a phenomenal job of working with you guys to identify, you know, how many uh, attendees you had. And I think last year, um, the one-day event that you guys host, if Rachel can help me if I mess this up, but the, I think it's like a $6.3 million for one day, you know, in terms of the tourists and people staying at our hotels and eating at our restaurants. So thanks for, for bringing all that to Albuquerque. So with that, I'm going to um, go ahead and let you guys, I don't think I have a, I don't have a, but I know you guys are going to do a presentation. My name is Lorenzo Otero. I'm with Artemis Promotions, my brother Joe Romero. And what we want to do is present the city council, President Davis, and the city council, all of you, uh, Chris Peña, thank you all very much for our continued relationship, the support that we have from all of you with you. It makes things a lot easier on us. We appreciate this continued relationship. We do, we throw this show to show the positivity. We, we throw this show to show the culture that we have here in Albuquerque and in New Mexico as a whole. So we wanted to present this to you guys and say thank you very much for the continued relationship and everything that you guys do. And if there's anything that we can ever do, we will continue to do our part to make sure that we can um, show this, this positive impact, our culture, who we are, and why we are the way we are, and uh, bring such a show of this magnitude to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And with your help, it's a blessing. So thank you very, very much. Would you mind taking that? There we go. And just share that with the council. It'd be great. Do you guys have any questions? I just want to say again, thank you guys for everything. I know with um, you know the lowrider culture here in Albuquerque, it's been something that we've been working together to really dispel some of the perception that people may or may not have about the lowrider community. You've been a tremendous asset in helping to accomplish that through the lowrider task force. Thanks for your involvement in that. And same to you guys, you know, and we got to just keep this move, uh, moving forward. So appreciate it. We appreciate you guys. God bless. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to administration question and answer period. Um, counselors, any questions for uh, the administration? Um, Councilor Bassan. Madam Vice President. Uh, first, I want to start by saying uh, that I, I had had an editorial printed in the newspaper yesterday in the Albuquerque Journal. and. I need to give a sincere apology. It was a complete, genuine omission on my behalf that Senator Mimi Stewart has also been a contributor. She's not in District 4, and she has been significantly supportive of this project. And uh, she brought it to my attention, and it was an oversight, but I apologize and, and will not make that mistake again. Uh, regarding the North Domingo Baca Aquatic Center, the last meeting that we, ha we had between staff, city departments, and architects and myself was on June 21st, and I was informed there were some concerns about soil and testing that needed to occur. The testing ended up coming back with the best possible results, and we were able to move forward as planned. I recently spoke with CAO Royale, and he had great responses to my questions regarding this topic and regarding um, the, the questions I have following. But I just want to make sure that because so many people have reached out to me about some of the big announcements that have had in Al we've had heard in Albuquerque, that we were able to get answers for the public to be able to hear as well. So Hewitt Zollers is the, is the consultant designing this project, and we were scheduled to go forward with a phase zero, and I think that we're getting close to that. We have positive soil results, uh, and then I'm hoping that we can move kind of seamlessly onto what we, what's being called phase one for the North Domingo Baca Aquatic Center. So my questions are, uh, because there's been some confusion in regards from that last meeting that we had on the 21st through last week, um, and then in my ability to respond to constituents and their inquiries, I want to know why has the North Domingo Baca Aquatic Center project not yet gone out to bid when we were told it would happen close to the positive results received on June 30th?
There it is. Um, good afternoon, uh, counselors. It's nice to see all of you after, uh, I'm sure you're all happy you had a nice month vacation from all of us. But nonetheless, um, Counselor um, Bassan, I've asked uh, Director Montoya to come up and, um, and provide some uh, information specifically on the questions that you sent earlier. Um, in our discussions last week, uh, my, I do want to say that um, we looked at the issue of bidding what's called phase zero, and just for everyone's information, phase zero really is, um, is uh, the infrastructure and the grading and retaining walls that's required uh, to get the site ready for construction, if you will. Uh, we had originally, I think, in the conversations with staff, had talked about potentially bidding that piece out. It was a small piece, but nonetheless would get the project moving forward. However, after reviewing the, the timing, et cetera, it seemed um, uh, a little bit more relevant for us to move forward with doing a, a simple change order to the contractor that's on site already doing the, the splash pad. Um, as you all know, there's a splash pad uh, component to this project. Um, and so we are in the process of, we have notified the contractor uh, to do a change order to do this work. Um, my understanding from the department is that we're waiting for the pricing to come in. As soon as the pricing is in, uh, we will do the change order and mobilize the contractor to start doing the, the earthwork and uh, there's a retaining wall that's part of the project and, uh, and getting the site prepped ready so that we can go to construction uh, very shortly. Um, and I will defer to uh, Director Montoya to give you a little bit more of the timing on that. And so, uh, but anyway, Counselor, um, you know, it's one of those, this is a, a massive project um, and uh, in the sense that it's, it's got a lot of pieces to it and it's somewhat complicated because of the site, but getting this piece of the work done is really uh, critical for ensuring that we can move to the next phases as we uh, move forward. So with that, Councilor, I'll have uh, Mr. Montoya talk to you, answer some of the questions that you might have specifically about the project. Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Bassan. So Lawrence did an excellent job of describing what I was going to say. I appreciate that. Let me just add one other thing. So BASIC is the contractor that is on board now to do the splash pad. We have selected them to go ahead and do the infrastructure work, which is basically the retaining wall. By the end of this week, we should have a price and a schedule from them. Uh, our understanding from the architect that once that work begins, it's about two months, probably six weeks, but we're giving them just a couple of extra weeks in through there. So we anticipate that all of the work for that phase of infrastructure attached to the splash pad and then onto the pool itself should be complete by September 30th. Thank you, Director. Uh, Madam Vice President, what construction documents still need to be finalized in order for this to go forward? Are there any others or are we just waiting on the, on the, the pricing? Mr. President and Councilor Bassan, all we're waiting for now is by August 31st, we should have all of the designs complete. Uh, at that point, we will uh, assemble all of the material that we need in order to take it to the planning department. At that point, uh, we would, would be able to go forward with permitting, um, and that probably is scheduled for right around August 31st or shortly after Labor Day. Thank you, Director. We were told in an email on July 24th uh, that the city's end of phase zero process could be done the first week in August. Obviously, we're not quite there, and you've answered that. So are there any other processes that need to be occur that might take me or constituents off guard and delaying the expectation being set? Do we anticipate any more holdups on that? Mr. President and Councilor Bassan, we do not. I think we were just waiting to make sure that we were clear with how we were going to use the on-call for the, uh, the infrastructure work. We don't anticipate any other delays on this project at all. Design should be complete again by the end of August, the first week after Labor Day. So we're on target to move forward with getting this process completed and then going out to bid. And, and Mr. President, if I might, I apologize, Councilor Bassan okay. and Mr. Montoya. There is one piece that I think is important for us to recognize, and that is that um, this project um, is uh, on the ballot in November as part of the CIP, there's six million dollars, right? So I think the only one to be candid about it would be is if for some reason those bonds fail, which is not usually the case, thank goodness, that our Albuquerque residents support the work that we've got before us. But I do want us to sort of make sure that we uh, know, as for the purposes of explaining it to the citizens, I know that you all as counselors know this, but those that may be watching, 
there is a $6 million bond question on the ballot uh, for this particular project, along with many others. So if those all happen and, uh, and, and everything goes according to plan, we shouldn't have any delays. But I just think it's important just to recognize that the citizens do have a right to weigh in on these issues, and I just want to make sure that we all appreciate that and understand that. So. Thanks, Mr. Rail. I definitely, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out, and I'm hopeful that voters will approve it for this project and many others as well. Uh, Madam Vice President, a few more. Uh, Director, what will phase one of the project be? Do we know yet? Because I know there's been some talk about it being the natatorium and some talk about it being the outdoor pool. Do you, have we solidified that option yet? Uh, Mr. Pre Mr. President and Councillor Bassan, uh, let me start by saying I, I know that you are invited to a meeting on Wednesday where we'll have another discussion about phase one and phase two or phase one with added alternates. So I don't think that decision has been made yet. Um, I think as a group, we'll be able to see what sort of funding we have in place and then at that point determine whether we do the outdoor pool as, the, as phase one or the number one project of, of that phase or we do the natatorium as phase one. But until we've secured all of the funding, and of course we don't know what that's gonna look like until we bid this project out, I think as a group, uh, a decision will be made, Mr. Royale will be involved, as to which of those two would go, go first. Thank you. But that, that decision has not been made yet. Okay, thank you. And Director, uh, there's been some other reports that certain uh, upper management in the city has told people that they're, what we're building is a splash pad and a three-lane pool for lap swimming. Is there a reason why certain people are describing that as the project that we're building? Because I can promise you, from the designs that we've seen so far, it's much more than that. Um, Mr. Well, I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President and Councillor Bassan, it's a long lap pool. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of conversations going about this. Um, Mr. Montoy and I did talk to uh, our other uh, colleague, uh, uh, Director Sanchez from Senior Affairs. Um, I think that may have been some of the conversations that might have been happening within her department at the Senior Center. And so we um, described to her what the project is and uh, she'll inform the staff there so they can be a little bit more accurate about what they tell the community members. But uh, yes, this, this project is, is much more than just a lap pool and uh, a splash pad. Thank you. Thoroughly agree. Uh, for those that want to know, North Domingo Baca Aquatic Center.com has pictures of more than the three lane lap pool. But uh, when is the splash pad scheduled for a ribbon cutting? When will that be completed? Uh, Mr. President, Comfort Bassan, assuming that we have no earthquake, hurricane, or windstorm, August 31st. Thank you. That is going to be very exciting for people as well. Um, so I'm excited that the leveling of the lot will happen. I appreciate, this is what we discussed last week. I appreciate the answers. I'm sure the, the public is going to appreciate it. I just wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure that phase zero should roll into phase one with add alternates, or even if we're gonna call it phase two where there's not a couple years of delay. So I wanna do my due diligence in ensuring that we're, we're all on the up and up and having these open conversations because a lot of people have reached out in regards to some of their large um, projects that have been announced in Albuquerque. Uh, so one of those large announcements is the potential for this United Stadium at Balloon Fiesta Park. Councilor Bassan, I apologize. Could I follow up on one of your questions? Well, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. North President. Domingo, yes, thank you. Before. Um, thank you, ma'am. And if it's okay, Madam Vice yep. President. I, I just want to ask, and just to clarify, I, we, I haven't been in those meetings and I'm curious, but it is a big project for the city. Mr. Ray Al, if you know, like, I, I know there's a bond package and there's what, six plus or minus million, all six on the ballot. Like, how determinative is that in order for this project to move forward? I realize we always do phasing. It's a little unusual for us to, I mean, we always do big designs so we can show people what we're working on and build projects. Um, but it is, you know, it's a little, we've had some money in this already, but it's a little unusual for our old process for us to sort of be this far along without having all the dollars or without at least having the final voter approval kind of, but we haven't sold the bonds yet kind of thing. How determinative is this in those phases that the, the ballot initiative pass? Well, Mr. Mr. President, um, it is unusual in the sense that, um, but not that we've not done that before, so I, I want to preface yeah. that. We've done other projects in some ways, the same way. Um, this project um, in current dollars is, and, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Montoya to correct me if I'm wrong, 
if, I'm not, if my memory serves me correctly, we have about $46 million on hand of funds from different, uh, if you will, funding sources, the state, et cetera, and, and, and our local, and the money that we have at the city. Um, the project, uh, the bond question has another $6 million. So that would bring the project uh, budget up to about $52 million. Um, the, at least the estimates that we're receiving is that, and, and Councilor Bassan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is probably somewhere between 56 and 58 million. That may be a little on the high side, but nonetheless, it's still, um, it's still not 100% funded. However, I think what we're uh, trying to get done here is, is do some, some work on determining what the next phase is and assuming, let's say, the next phase is, is within the 40, uh, the 46 million that we have today, then I th we can obviously, you know, move forward with that piece, and probably look at somehow some process where we would have alternates for phase two and phase three, pending approval of funds from the bond, from the bond question. The irony of it all is that um, this is probably an 18 to 20, maybe 24 month construction period once we start. Um, so we have a legislative session. You have the, obviously the bond elections on November, but and then the funding for the from the bond proceeds, assuming it's up, approved, are probably available sometime in March or February, March April timeframe of next year. So sequentially, I think it all works. Um, but you know, it, the irony of it all is, is is scoping this first phase is really important because if for some reason something doesn't come together you want a project that actually works in and of oh. itself, right? Madam, Madam Vice Chair, I think maybe Councilor Bassan wants to follow up, but I just want to ask, I, I think I wanted to make that clear, right? In my conversations with you and the administration and Councilor Bassan, this was a priority for the council, for your district, and it's been your pri CIP priority for, for a while. Like, I just wanted to be sure, like, it's been my understanding that the mayor certainly been supportive of getting this done and moving this, fa getting this done and phasing it in the right way so we can work on it now, show some progress, while we're cleaning up the back end and the finances department, um, whether it's relying on capital outlay or voter bonds or whatever. And so it sounds, I just want to be clear, like to folk, the voters sort of out there and hearing that process, like the plans are still moving, things are moving forward, we're scoping and phasing it that way. Um, and we're not going to stop it just waiting on November. Like there's stuff that we can get done and it sounds like it's moving. And so that's. Mr. President, there is. I mean, depending on kind of who you talk to and whether or not we're including the money that's going to be used to pay for design and whatnot, there's at least at least $38 million in the bank, whether it's the 38 or the 44. Um, again, that's kind of where it gets in the, the mud of have we spent it on design or not. But there's, in my opinion, enough. $38 million should be enough to start making progress on this, which is also why I think it's really important to ask how we're going to potentially phase it so that... We can, we can ensure that whatever money we have on hand in the bank is what we're working together on ensuring that that portion can at least be completed. However, the eternal optimist in me, and what I keep telling administration and everyone else, is that I will continue to work very hard so that we won't have to phase it per se because I want us to do everything we can to get that final funding so that our total dollar amount is accumulated before we really get into the project very far. Thank you. Um, anything else? Okay. All right, you want to continue? Thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you, Madam Vice President. So going back to one of the other large announcements that happened in July is that we were told about a potential for the United Stadium having a public-private partnership at Balloon Fiesta Park. I want to make sure that the constituents that reach out to me hear it via email, text message, and phone call, but also I want them to hear here that because I've received... Uh, a lot of correspondence for that. I want to answer to all the constituents, and what I have to tell them is, I know what you know. I don't know anymore, because I haven't been involved in any of the conversations up until last week, when I, when I did speak to Mr. Rael. So uh, because of that answer, I do want to continue again in asking the questions. Uh, Mr. Rael did a great job of answering those at our meeting, but I think that there's a lot of people who would like to know um, more details about what the timeline is, what's happening, um, if and when things are happening. So um, I also want to make sure to, to make note that people understand that my suggestion 
which is just a suggestion, was to have meetings and listen to what concerns people have. Um, so I'm definitely hoping that when these pre-development meetings do occur that there's a lot of listening going on. But moving on to my questions, uh, Mr. Rael or, or whomever, when is the admin going to um, hold meetings with the public? And when are they scheduled to occur and where? Mr. President and, and Councillor Bassan, um, first and foremost, I, I did read uh, your, your op-ed. And, uh, and I would say to you that, look, I, I think on a practical matter, the rail trail and the stadium and the, and the aquatic park, along with many other projects that are in all of our districts, or your districts, I should say, are all really super important. I'm not so sure that the, that the forget the rail trail and soccer stadium, what about North Domingo Baca might have been your headline, because I understand that usually the press picks their own headlines. But um, nonetheless, uh, to answer your question specifically, the stadium um, has been, um, is, is a, a process that is going to take um, a few months, if you will, to give uh, not only the opportunity for the public, in particular neighborhoods, et cetera, others to weigh in, uh, just simply because of the way our IDO process works. Uh, in order to um, look at potentially locating the stadium uh, in and around the Balloon Fiesta Park, there has uh, some, if you will, land use um, steps that we have to go through uh, to ensure that uh, we um, amend the land use plan that governs right now the, uh, the Balloon Fiesta Park. It is required in us to go through a process that will involve uh, notifying the neighborhoods of the fact that the, that the actual master plan right now prohibits the construction of an outdoor stadium uh, or, the, or placing an outdoor stadium on the site. Uh, in order to move in that direction, we would need to have an amendment to the Balloon Fiesta master plan which requires a, a public process. Typically with these public processes, as you all know, is once you start in um, developing, if you will, or amending these master plans, the obvious questions that the neighborhoods and the community want to see is, well, what is this going to look like? Where is it going to be? What's all the details associated with it? Because we want to make sure that we know what it is we're, uh, if you will, uh, agreeing to or, or what have you. So we have been working with uh, the developer, uh, or in this case, the, 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 the owner of the United team and his, his staff, his representatives, to develop a site plan so that when we go to the public process of informing the neighborhoods of the desire to amend the plan at the Balloon Fiesta Park, that we have a lot of that information on hand so that the neighbors know exactly what is being proposed. Included in that is also such things as traffic uh, studies, if you will, the noise studies and the lighting studies, if you will, because of, of the nature of the, of the facility that's being contemplated. All of those, all of that information is being gathered. So what I told Councillor Bassan last week is that our goal is to, is, uh, per the IDO, is to have a pre-development meeting with the uh, appropriate neighborhoods in close proximity to the Balloon Fiesta Park to begin the discussion of amending the master plan to permit a facility like this to be constructed um, on the site. That, uh, those pre-development meetings as per the IDO will occur with, within the next seven to eight days, we will send out notifications to the neighborhoods. My suspicions and my sense after uh, just wanting, being around and the development of the Balloon Fiesta Park in particular, that I'm sure we're gonna get uh, an immediate response from the neighborhoods to have a conversation, which is totally appropriate and, and, and fine with, uh, with the administration and with the project, if you will, uh, participants. So we will schedule those meetings with the neighborhoods. Once those meetings occur, depending on the conversation, et cetera, as it relates to changes or what have you, uh, we need then to go through a formal process to submit the application to the Environmental Planning Commission for their review and consideration as part of their due diligence on, on behalf of, of you all as the governing body and the land use uh, body to review that um, and then make a determination uh, and obviously 
have more meetings with the community about it. If in fact the EPC approves that, then we would move forward with then the, the next phase of the, of the conversation of the project. But um, it is our intent, Councillor Bassan, to, to follow the IDO process um, and to have those meetings uh, here very shortly. Um, and keep in mind, I would say, um, as you all know, the project is, um, is a privately financed soccer stadium. Uh, what we are proposing to do is to develop a, a land lease with the ownership of the team to lease the property where the, uh, where the actual uh, stadium will go to the team, um, much like we do to some extent on many of other properties that we have. A little bit of a different, if you will, deal than what we did with Isotopes, but nonetheless, Isotopes actually does pay us a lease for the use of the facility. In this case, they will be paying us a lease for the use of the land that it, where the city sits on. They will build the facility with private dollars. We do have public funds available through the legislature to do improvements to the site, to provide infrastructure to the site for not just the purposes of potentially of the stadium, but also to the benefit of the park. And that would be water and sewer lines, as you all know, during the fiesta, we have a lot of extension cords running around and a lot of generators and a lot of other things that um, are probably not the most safest things for given the size and the, and the uh, liability that might be associated with the number of folks that go to the park for, the, for that event and for many other events. So we would then be building uh, a lot more infrastructure to the park uh, to benefit the park and the city in the long term. These are all state dollars that were appropriated over the course of the last two or three, four sessions of the legislature, and those are funds that we have available in particular, I would just point one piece that I think is super important, because I know it, it's important to all of us, and that is that we part of this project also includes looking at bathrooms <laughs> for the facility in that um, they're desperately needed as part of the infrastructure that right now is, as you all know, they're just porta potties most of the time for the fiesta. So part of this is actually investing in some real infrastructure uh, projects that are going to benefit the fiesta, but also benefit the park in totality, and at the same time, potentially create the opportunity, should we be successful through the processes that we're going to do, to be in a situation where we can enter into a lease and potentially have a, a privately financed uh, facility there at the park for the benefits of the entire community and, and quite frankly, the state. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, thank you, Mr. Rael. Uh, he he answered all my additional questions and then some. But I just want to make sure to point out that I had twice as many questions that he answered last week. So I did shorten it for tonight's meeting. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Rael. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor uh, Councilor Lewis or Sanchez. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The question I had for the administration is I'm just curious if anybody talked to the Balloon Fiesta about it and what their response is in reference to the stadium going where they normally have the balloon fiesta. Um, I've heard rumor that uh, the balloon fiesta, since it's its own entity, can pack up and take everything to a whole different um, community and leave us high and dry for the millions and millions of dollars that the balloon fiesta generates. So what is the balloon fiesta's response to this stadium? Mr. President and, um, and Councillor Sanchez, uh, We've talked to the president of the Fiesta um, here over the last course of the last two or three, about up three months about this um, um, idea and this concept. They were available, they were actually present when we made the first announcements. They are part of the group, uh, Councilor Sanchez, of constituents that we will be consulting with immediately as well, um, along with the neighborhoods. Um, it would be all the Balloon Fiesta Board and providing them a, if you will, the same level of information that we will be providing the uh, neighborhoods as it relates to, to the project. Um, we've had uh, conversations, uh, especially as it relates to the public dollars that are available to provide some of the much needed infrastructure for the site. Um, I know that there's a lot of concerns about, about this facility from them 
Um, and I, I think what uh, we'll present to them will, will be, quite frankly, um, I think viewed as an opportunity to, quite frankly, not only make the park a lot more usable and a lot better for the fiesta, but also potentially look at how the facility itself might be an actual benefit to the park and to the fiesta, just simply because of its ability to provide things as simple as, like I said earlier, bathrooms that might be available for both use during the fiesta and use for the stadium itself. Or one of the big issues as we experienced last year with the fiesta was, um, quite frankly, finding a place for shelter in place, if you will, in case of inclement weather. When you have a facility of this size that can accommodate a pretty sizable crowd, uh, places like that. So uh, we're looking for opportunities to make the uh, facility a win-win for both the community as a whole and for the fiesta and for the team. And um, of course, you know, until we get to the details, Councillor Sanchez um, will, will present those. And, and I will say to you, uh, look, um, the city has invested millions and millions of dollars in uh, uh, really making the Balloon Fiesta Park a, a, a Class A facility as best we can. Um, we are not interested from an administration standpoint, and I think I can speak for all of us in the community, of having the fiesta relocate to another community. Um, that's always a question and always something that any, any board, any community group like this can make. But um, at least from the conversations I've had with the president, um, they've assured us that that's not their intent. They, are, they like being here. They like for us to look at additional places to land balloons, more landing sites. We're working diligently with things, such small things like Working with public agencies like APS and others, can we uh, move, remove power lines from soccer fields and baseball fields so that during Fiesta, if uh, balloons need to make landings, we can use public spaces like those uh, and, and creating some opportunities to, to find more landing sites in the, in the Albuquerque area. So, uh, Councilor Sanchez, um, we will be uh, working with them and, uh, and, and attempting to ensure that they feel comfortable that. Uh, that this is a, a good situation for all of us concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I have one follow-up to that. Um, when you were saying that you were going, you never really answered the question about how many meetings there would be between admin and constituents. What is that plan? And then a follow-up. Is this, are you planning on getting this IDO change or this master plan changed in this next session of the IDO change? Or is this going to be a year and a half planning kind of thing? Because I certainly don't want it to be rushed through. This is something that we really need to make sure that our constituents and everybody is buying into, under, first of all, understanding the process, what you're proposing, how they are not paying for it, and it's privately paid for. Um, all of those things, and uh, a real good plan is set in motion before it's rushed through. Mr. President and, and Councillor Grout, let me go back and say, the IDO process that is um, our zoning process, if you will, requires that on any projects, whether it's government or the private sector, um, have uh, if you will, discussions with neighborhoods, pre-submittal, if you will, uh, presentations to the neighborhoods. So at a minimum, we're going to have the first conversation will be with the neighborhoods to talk about the process. That's just what's required under the rules. Um, so at a minimum, there will be one meeting. Obviously, there could be additional meetings if we find that there are some areas where we can make some modifications to garner, uh, if you will, support and or to see how we can make the project better for the neighborhoods. So um, that is what the process requires now. Um, and just so you'll know, uh, the Environmental Planning Commission really is the public body that will, will hear the request to amend the plan um, and will obviously have several public meetings, I suspect, to have that conversation. So, I, so to answer your question directly, um, there will be multiple meetings uh, with interest groups as we move through this process, and um, and quite frankly, uh, we we intend to try and submit this to the to the uh, EPC um, as soon as we possibly can, probably uh, October timeframe, 
And so there'll be some conversations over the next three or four months with the community uh, at various levels and, and these presentations will be obviously very public. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that they're very, very public. That's really important. Thank you. Um, any other, yes. Sorry, Mr. thank Bassan. you, Madam Vice President. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I would say, you had touched on uh, lighting, sound, and traffic. I know that another one is parking, and I know that we've, you know, I've heard several ideas and options, but I definitely look forward to hearing more details about that. And then will you please, Mr. Rael, make sure that I also receive notification of when these meetings will occur, because I would love to be there in attendance so that I can hopefully try to be a liaison between council, admin, the, the public, um, and at least kind of keep my thumb on it as best as I can. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's great. Thank you. Um, Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I just had a couple of questions for the Animal Welfare Department, and I think I saw Director Ortega here earlier. Oh, there she is. Come on down. Um, I stopped by the shelter the other day, and you know, as always, we have too many animals. And um, I did hear that there was a very successful spay-neuter clinic, um, high-volume spay-neuter clinic, uh, while we were on break. And I just wanted to get some additional information from you on how it went, how many animals got serviced. Um, you know, was it a success? Yes, Mr. Chair and Councilor Feeblecorn, it was a huge success. Um, it occurred between July 7th and July 9th. Our goal was to spay and neuter 200 pets. We did spay and neuter 169 pets, um, not because we couldn't take on more, but because some people didn't show up. So now we know it was our first annual. So um, live and learn. Next time we'll over schedule and I think we'll hit our 200 target. This spay and neuter blitz was actually definitely an, ex an example of the power of us kind of mentality. Many groups got together to make this happen. We outsourced um, to a, a group called Animal Balance that brought in two vet teams to be able to make this happen. Um, so it was basically set up as a MASH unit at the Fire Academy. So we're so grateful to Chief Jaramillo and her team. They really helped us to um, find the perfect facility to make this happen. It was a drive-through service um, where we brought in the, the pets, spayed and neutered them, and then allowed uh, the, the owners, the pet parents, to pick them up at the end of the day we had about 30 volunteers to make this happen as well. Of course, our animal welfare team, and um, it really was uh, created to supplement our, span, our preventative pet care clinic at the east side. So we really were intentional about having this um, done at the west side so that we would have more access for the entire city. Um, we plan on continuing to do this at least three times a year um, but absolutely as much as budget and time allows. Um, it, it, was a, it was a great event, and we're very proud of how it rolled out. Of course, there wasn't a lot of promotion for it because we wanted to make sure that it rolled out as well as we hoped it would, uh, but we are looking at scheduling the second one um, in the late fall, uh, winter months um, to get a, ahead of that spring, um, <laughs> that spring over overcrowding uh, of our pets. Yeah, thank you. And so um, we are contracting with Animal Balance again um, to do these in the fall and then maybe three or four times next year as well? Yes, yes. So the goal is to have at least three times during a fiscal year, but absolutely um, three times during a calendar year. Um, every every event, we will be doing 200 span neuters. Right now, in our preventative pet care clinic, we're doing about 100 a week. Um, so it definitely helps. We've significantly brought down our lottery wait list. Uh, we have currently 1,600 in our lottery wait list, and that's actually how we schedule out these blitzes. Is we we hit that lottery first. Thank you for doing that. I do think it's really important for our community. We just have too many unspayed, neutered animals running around our community. So I'm really glad there's a plan. Um, I did want to touch base on the situation with our veterinarian staff because I know we're short-staffed. 
Um, we, you know, there's only so many we can do because we cannot get those positions filled, it's my understanding. So could you just give us an update on where we are on veterinarians um, who are, you know, employed by the city that are doing that regular spay neuter, not the high volume, but the, like these events are going to be? Yes, Mr. Chair and Councilor Feeblecorn, that has been an ongoing issue, not just locally, but, but nationwide. Uh, it's a supply and demand issue right now, and, and we're going to really have to be competitive if we're going to start recruiting, um, recruiting vets. I am working with our HR department closely. They understand the sense of urgency around uh, us hiring vets. Right now, we have two and a half vets to serve a, over 1,000 pets in the shelter right now, uh, and it's just not enough. Uh, we do contract out vets. Um, but, I mean, really the goal is to get those positions filled so that we can attack this issue um, at more a, gra a, a grander scale. Um, we do have some interest, but again, the major issue is the, the pay. Right now, we're not competitive, and, and I know that the HR department has really been looking on, on the research to make us competitive when it comes to all positions, not just the vets, but the vets are definitely a priority. Thank you, and I want to give you a, um, a little kudos because uh, we passed a bill in the legislature this year that makes it somewhat easier for veterinarians who are out of state with out of state licenses to come here um, and, and work here immediately, and that was um, your original idea that we were able to run with, so I think that um, the Animal Welfare Department is doing some really out-of-the-box thinking. A friend of mine in Florida just sent me today an example of the advertisements that you're doing on the national front to try to get more staff here, so I want to thank you for that. And then before we let you go, um, I know you would not normally do this, but I'm going to make you. Uh, I understand that you have gotten some more training and that you are doing some additional um, education around shelter management. I would love it if you just shared with the other counselors that that opportunity and, and um, how you're you're doing in that um, training. Mr. Chair and Councilor Feeblecorn, uh, thank you for that. Um, as many of you know, I, I came to run animal welfare without shelter experience. Many of, most of my experience was around business and not-for-profit organizations. What I was able to do over this last six months was attend a master's level certification program uh, through Southern Utah University, and I was able to achieve my Animal Welfare Executive Leadership Certification. Um, it was a six, it, I received six credit hours for that, and because I do believe that it's so essential for continuing to think outside the box with animal welfare, I will be parlaying that into a actual master's program starting in October that is an interdisciplinary program uh, a tri-focus in modern-day animal welfare, uh, public administration, and uh, leadership. Thank you. Thank you for being here and telling us about that. I just, you know, I, I'm really, I think we're all proud of you for doing that, and you're just the perfect example of the really talented, dedicated people that work for the city of Albuquerque, and we are just so grateful to have you giving your time and energy to the Animal Welfare Department. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, do you have a question? Uh, I just wanted to say why I saw you. Uh, no, ma'am. No, sorry, Director. Go, you're fine. I just want to say why I saw Chief Parmio here. I wanted to say uh, congratulations and commend the members of your department and the county fire department yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, it was quite a big event down at uh, at Mesa del Sol uh, with the plastic recycling facility, and, and uh, you not only responded to my uh, sort of col colorful text yesterday, uh, really quickly with the information we all needed to be sure the neighbors who were all screaming at us to figure out what was on fire. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you so much. They did a fabulous job. I mean, there's some structure damage, there's some other things, but I got to listen to some of that radio traffic and other things yesterday. They did a fabulous job in containing that, given the winds and everything else. Um, and, and to our environmental health department, who got those alerts out, gave notices to what folks needed to do. Um, it was a lot of coordination uh, by a lot of folks, and the Water Authority showed up on Sunday with their own calls. Everybody showed up on Sunday afternoon when everybody else was doing something else, and it really did make a big difference. So thank you. Uh, we're glad Mesa del Sol didn't burn down. We have some big ideas for that coming up uh, this week. And <laughs> yeah. so we appreciate that very much, and please send that congrats to those, those units and everybody who responded. 
And Mr. President, if I might just add one other uh, point of information for all of you. Um, I, it occurred to us as we were going through this endeavor yesterday, and, and it's been a while, that we probably do need to do a freshen up, a fresh course review for all of you on emergency, uh, if you will, situations that occur. Um, you know, most of the time, you all will get the calls before sometimes even I do. And um, I can appreciate you all wanting to at least be able to tell your constituents who to call and what to do. Um, so I've asked uh, Mr. Ebner, our uh, emergency management officer, to potentially have scheduled some meetings with all of you just to give you a little bit of a baseline of information of these things occur, um, how and who to call so that you can at least um, provide some guidance to your uh, to the people that you know that you know, et cetera, in your communities, and and so. But uh, thank you, Mr. President, for recognizing the, the efforts of these two departments. It was a, a pretty significant event, and they did a great job. Thank you, and, uh, Councillor Pena. Um, thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, so, Councillor. Um, Council President Davis, you know, I just want to say also, you know, I just thought it was pretty phenomenal. We were up there when we seen the small fire and we were up there as it started to grow. So we didn't know if it was an airplane crash or whatever. But I just want to say that I think that the way it was the response and the way everyone, I mean, we just had tons of cars flying by us as we were driving, you know, the, the fire rescue and stuff. So we knew it was something serious. And, and so I just want to congratulate. But I did want to ask you, Mr. Rael, or maybe it's for the chief, just to, just a couple of questions about how did that impact services in the community? And I know, I think last year or this year, we actually put something forward saying that there were only like three men per truck where we used to have four. So it's just, I'm only asking those questions because it just was awesome, but it would made me wonder, do we have a plan in place for, you know, um, ad addressing the issues that we're having here in the community and, and did it make a difference having the three-man truck rather than the four-man truck? Um, thank you, Councillor Pena, um, uh, President Davis. Uh, so we we always staff to our minimal minimum levels, um, and we have preferred staffing in minimal levels. Uh, we make every effort to staff an engine with four personnel. So that's a lieutenant, a driver, and two firefighters. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes that is. I know we, I've been up here talking about overtime <laughs> with council before. Um, I talk a lot with uh, city administration about our overtime. Uh, when we don't have enough personnel on duty to staff, that's when we call in overtime to fill those critical vacancies to be fully staffed. Um, as far as last night or yesterday, uh, we, we had two incidents going on. We had the actual fire at the facility, and then it jumped over the, the road and created a wildland incident. So we actually had to dispatch our wildland task force to the incident also. Um, it does drain from our resources, so that's why it is so important that all of our um, apparatus are fully staffed and in service and that we're not shutting a truck down or something like that for staffing levels. Um, so as far as last night, there was a point that we, we, we calculated we had about a third of our department working on the incident, um, and that didn't include county, uh, Kirtland, Corrales, they all also assisted us. Um, so what happens then is that the neighboring fire stations will respond to emergencies. Sometimes we relocate, so if there's like a huge drain in the southeast because it was in the kind of southeast area, we'll relocate to kind of cover the, the areas for uh, response um, from other areas of town, just to kind of make do in the, at that point in time. Um, but as far as uh, as our staffing levels, we were uh, staffed yesterday. We did, you know, we had um, personnel on the trucks to take care of it, and everybody was working. That was on the incident when I got there. Every single person that was on the incident was doing some type of work. Thank you, thank you. So I'm glad they, um, Council President, recognized you guys. So I thought it was pretty awesome. Thank you. Well, the fire was terrible, but your response was awesome. Thank you. So, um, was I next? Yep. So, thank you. That was it. I just had some a different questions. So, I just wanted to um, talk to um, who's the new director for, and I guess it's for Mr. Rael, but you know, the, the county has a really phenomenal program where they have the sports programs after school and they're held at county facilities. 
you know, I'm, I'm probably going to talk to some of the other counselors and talk at ABCGC, but they really do a really good job for kids who really need those kind of activities. You know, I think we could do a better job here in Albuquerque of having prevention intervention efforts and really providing. I remember growing up when you signed up for the community center, you know, however many could fit in that building showed up there. Now I know because of liability and issues like that that we don't have. But I don't know that we as a city, I don't know if we help sponsor it, but if we don't, if we do it or don't do it or, you know, I would like for us to start doing some of those programs and, you know, just kind of bolster what the county's doing. Because now, if you have a game, if you're in the county program and you have a game, you either go to Los Padillas or you go over there to Paradise because it's in the county. And we have so many facilities here in the city of Albuquerque, whether it be APS or our community centers that can be utilized to make sure that we provide opportunities and things for our kids to be able to do to keep them out of trouble so that we're not facing some of the things that we're facing now. And I know this isn't necessarily, I just wanted to bring it up. I think it's an important, it's a missed opportunity for us. And I'm hoping we can get together with the county and, and um, APS and really provide these opportunities. We're having, um, you know, I live across the street from Alamosa School. It's one of the schools, it's the a Title I school. You know, there's lots of needs there. And I have a gym right across the street from me. And this is an APS thing, so it's not directed to you. But we have a, a gym and it's locked after hours, right? And we have the fields that are locked after hours. And this is just, seems like it's like a no-brainer for us as a city to kind of collaborate to make sure that we make, reignite all these facilities and make sure that we're providing those opportunities for underserved um, students in our area, so. Mr. President and, and Councilor Pena, um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I know it's been one of the initiatives that the mayor has really been uh, focused on um, here over the last couple of years to, to look at how do we create opportunities to, to partner with APS in particular and with the county in providing some uh, good programs and alternative programs for our youth as a whole. Um, Mr. Martinez, Jess Martinez, as you know, who runs our community centers, and, and now Ms. Kata Sandoval, who is who is here as well, um, who has uh, really grew up in, in the education world um, and has worked at the state and worked uh, at APS and knows uh, a lot of the folks that, are, that, that um, are involved with these management of these facilities. So uh, to your point, Councillor, we'd love to have a conversation with you about that. Um, but we do want to partner up with APS and provide more after school programs and and with county and, and, and use our facilities um, to the extent possible. Obviously, we do have programming in some of these areas, and we do have some joint use agreements, no question about it. But as you said, pointing out to the gymnasium as a one example, um, I'm not so sure it's a across the board, if you will, um, initiative. It's a one-off. You know, one school might be okay. A lot of what you know, at least from the, my previous engagement in this issue, Sometimes a lot of it's the site-based control is with the principals at the schools, right? They, they manage the facilities, and, and in some cases, we're able to do some great things. In some cases, not so, not so much. So we are looking at that, so be happy to visit with you and have uh, Jess and Kata get with you and maybe see what kind of plans we can put together. Thank you. And just as a follow-up to that is that I just wanted to say that, you know, I know APS is doing this. I'm hearing that they're doing this is that, they're charging a rental fee, and you know we're trying to really um, figure out a way around the anti-donation. You know this whole anti-donation thing. I think we should get rid of it because I, I think we really need to partner more with our um, local governments that, that that are neighboring us. But um, you know we're we're charging fees. I know APS is charging like you know there's these nonprofits because the city can't necessarily run these basketball programs. So sometimes they partner with nonprofits to run these basketball programs or soccer programs or whatever. And, and in order to use facilities, they're being charged like a $2,000 fee for the nonprofit that's providing these, um, these opportunities for kids. So I'd really like to have that conversation too about this, you know, it seems ridiculous, right? I mean, it, it does seem ridiculous that we're, you know, tiptoeing around this, you know, anti-donation when we partner with these people to, you know, provide a service for our kids and we help to, we sponsor them and we do all these things, but then 
um, when it comes to them using, I'll say, a gym, they have to pay two thousand dollars because it makes it kind of unattainable, and then they don't, they can't afford the fee, and then they don't do it, and then um, ki kids that are in underserved areas are going from Los Padillas all the way to um, Raymond G. Sanchez or to the Paradise Hills, and just back and forth, and it's just uh, something where I think we can collaborate better. So I will stop beating that dead horse and um, just say that I look forward to that conversation and I'm going to reach out to the county and to APS and I think at ABCGC. So um, I think that was the last of my questions other than I, I really, you know, we had an opportunity today. We uh, um, did a, it's not groundbreaking, but it was like an unveiling of a program that we have for the neon signs on Central. So myself and Councilor Grout, in your, your, in your hood, so. Yeah. <laughs> and so me and Councilor Grau and, and the mayor had an opportunity to stop up by a business. That business is right there by the uh, library that's really, and so it just we just took that opportunity to go there. And I'm just hoping that as the administration can go and have zoning and whoever else go out there, solid waste and look at, you know, the trash cans over full. So we may not be able to do anything about the business, but we can do stuff to, site and make that place more presentable and clean. Today we went and they have two trash containers, um, Waylon will know all about mm -hmm. this, but two cra trash containers that were overfilled and spilling. So usually as a code enforcer, they, they'll go in and they'll say, hey, well, if you're having too much trash, then you need another container. And, you know, so I think there's things like that that we can do to hold that bus business accountable as well. So thank you. Mr. President, I just want to just uh, on that point, if you, if I may, uh, to you and Councillor Grout, uh, the mayor did talk to me about that and appreciated uh, you all taking the time to go look at that particular site. As you know, we've been aggressively looking at a way to change the, uh, if we will, the model there in that particular uh, uh, establishment. Um, Councillor Davis uh, was there as well when we first announced that we were looking at taking some pretty strong action. Our city attorney will tell you that we are in court. I think we have a hearing, as a matter of fact, on Tuesday. On Tuesday. But to the point that you're making also is that ensuring that, that our zoning folks are out there looking at the things like the additional, you know, if you will, uh, container for the trash, et cetera, that that's part of the responsibility of the, of the property owner and or the business. And so we'll, we'll continue to move forward. But he did mention that and appreciate both of you taking time to look at it. And um, Madam Vice President, just to add to that too, you know, I know that when these businesses go in, they have side development plans for landscaping, and I know we don't have a tool in how to enforce that once they let all their landscaping die. I think we need to look at that in the future of how we, you know, um, we had, um, by my place, we had the Albertsons close, and they had grass and trees, and then now there's a, a Choose Fitness in there, thank God, that they filled the building, but in the interim, everything died there and it's still pretty dead. And so I think we have to really come up with a process, whether it be through resolution or something to, to address that as well. So it's been an interesting first day back. Sorry to unload on all you guys, <laughs> but I have a long laundry list. It gave me plenty of time to think during the break. <laughs> thank you, um, okay. Madam Vice President. Thank you. I'd also like to thank um, AFR and, and Chief Armijo, um, Armijo. she um, responded Quickly. It was very nice. I know she was busy, and um, it meant a lot that she got back right away. So we were able to communicate with our constituents, and I thought that was important. So, and I'm really glad everybody was safe and there were no injuries. That's the most important thing. Um, I have a few questions for APD. I'm not sure if anybody's here. I sent these to them. He's on Zoom. Oh, good. Hi. Oh, good. 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 Um, thank you for being here. Um, Let's see, I have a few questions about cameras that we have around the city. How many cameras are around the city are connected to the real-time crime center? So right now we have approximately 9,000 cameras um, that are visible to the real-time crime center. Uh, it's composed of a mix of city cameras, DOT cameras, um, there are APS cameras, um, and uh, there are some private business cameras in there as well. Okay, so thank you. So then that would be my next question. Are there any privately owned um, cameras? And so you just answered that one. I understand that city-owned cameras have to be placed in the public right-of-way. 
but can the cameras be placed so that they can also monitor shopping centers and other businesses? So we generally almost exclusively install what they call PTZ cameras, which are pan, tilt, and zoom. Um, so they can be installed in the public right of way, um, but they have the ability to turn and focus and zoom in on um, any area that uh, is visible to that camera. So um, the, the, if the camera is fixed and it is fixed position, but we don't have uh, a lot of those, um, th then we can't move that camera. But the vast majority of them are PTZ and they can be turned to uh, private business. Okay, thank you. And then what would it take for private property owners to have their own cameras connected to the real-time crime center? I am glad you asked because we would like to see more of those. Yes. Um, the city has uh, its real-time crime center. Um, for those who don't know, um, it is uh, the center that's up on uh, the hill up by the communication center. Um, the administration has invested heavily in technology and it's kind of the brain where all the technology comes into. Um, that is where all the cameras come into. Uh, so for someone to sign up, there's two components to the program that we call Community Connect. Um, and one is a camera registry where anyone can register their camera. That way should something happen uh, around their house or uh, where a camera that they own personally might be able to have captured, um, it lets the real-time crime center know the location of that camera. There's no direct connection to that camera in the registry. Um, the Community Connect uh, live cameras are those cameras which a business can register with us and we can obtain a live stream from their cameras. Um, and essentially what they need to do is either they can Google Albuquerque Community Connect or they can go to the city website and uh, search Community Connect. That will take them to the web page for the Community Connect program, which we'll explain in more detail than I, I have time here to do. Um, and it will give them a link to email us uh, to ask for the specifications uh, for the cameras. And uh, we will uh, get that email and we will reach out to them and let them know what the process is. Very good, thank you. I'm really glad that there is a um, vehicle so that um, we as private citizens can and it, um, put our cameras towards um, your big, big, beautiful operation. I have seen it. It is impressive. It is working, and um, I'm really grateful for it. So if we could get more people to communicate with it and connect to it, it, it could help us significantly. So I appreciate that. Thank you for being here today on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my next questions are for Mr. Rayel. Um, I was looking at the fiscal year 23 budget and there's a line item under the quarter cent public safety tax for 1.8 million dollars for administrative operating costs and this is a large line um, is it's three percent of the quarter cent appropriations only the lines of emergency shelter contracts and gibson medical center are higher now that the 2023 fiscal year is over I'd like a breakdown of how the quarter cent public safety tax money was actually spent. Uh, what do those 1.8 million in administrative costs consist of? And then I'll have two more after that. Um, Mr. President and, and Councilor Grout, uh, thank you for that question. Um, mm -hmm. First, let me just say that we will get you more detail than I can give you today, however. Okay. Um, that tax was uh, imposed by the city in 2004. It's a, a quarter cent uh, public safety tax. It generates today right around 55, almost $56 million a year to the general fund, if you will. I don't, when that tax was uh, imposed by the council back in 2004, uh, it was split as 34% went to police, 34% went to fire and emergency uh, preparedness. It was back in the days when the city actually ran the jail and there was 6% um, that was dedicated to the corrections department. And then 26% went to prime, crime prevention and, and intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the 1.8 million, if you will, that is uh, part of the indirect cost associated with, with that uh, fund, I am told by our budget folks, is 
is several things. It is the administrators that manage the programs in each of the three or four components that I just, um, uh, if you will, uh, talked about. It also talks about the costs associated with, with the procurement of goods and services related to any of those programs and the administration of the, if you will, of the management of the funds, the accounting division, the, uh, and the managers that, that, that run the programs. But I will be, uh, I asked our budget office to break those down for you a little bit more so you have a little bit more detail on that. Most of the funds, obviously, as, as any other tax would go, um, usually in many of these are really about personnel costs, right? Hiring additional police officers, paying for them, uh, and then managing programs that might be uh, related to crime and, and prevention and intervention. Uh, so some programs, for example, that are administered through family and community services are a lot of our mental health programs, um, youth programs. Um, I'll give you a good example. Uh, New Day Youth and Family Services, uh, the New Mexico Coalition to End Homelessness, um, the Rape Crisis Center, um, and many more of the like that provide uh, either services through uh, organizations that help with the prevention and or intervention, if you will, uh, aspects of it. Uh, fire preparedness, uh, also for our fire department and some of the work that they do. It is uh, lumped into the general fund, if you will, with the rest of the, of the funds that are available for, for the, the departments. Keep in mind, if you look at the police department, the budget is like twice as much. So this is a, um, you know, 34% of the 55 million is not a lot, but it's, it certainly helps uh, as we sort of put the budget together. But um, I've asked our uh, finance office to, and the budget office to get you a, a, a briefing on that and give you a little more detail. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned just now like New Day and the Homeless um, Council. Mm -hmm. um, underneath that breakdown, you've got youth gang contracts, Substance abuse contracts, mm -hmm. human and health, health and human services, homeless support services. Would those contracts and those dollars be under those um, line items? Mr. President and Counselor, um, I would defer to to the budget office to give you a specific for sure. But it sounds like some of the work that those organizations are doing are probably in the prevention or, or in the intervention okay. category of, of crime. Okay, and then the 34% of the taxes to be used for APD. Mm -hmm. So is 34%, that is an, a totally different line. Are you also including APD um, salaries in administrative costs also? Met, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. President and Counselor Grout, I, I will tell you that it, there's probably a portion that goes to that in that um, in order to support the police department, you've got to have the people that manage the programs and the people that deliver the services, right? And so I'm assuming there is, but again, um, it's, um, it's a small piece of the department, but yes, I'm sure there is some of that going to that. Well, thank you. I, I will look forward to seeing this complete breakdown because <laughs> it's, um, I will look forward to a complete breakdown. I appreciate okay. that. <laughs> sure. um, and then I have one more question. Does the city have a standard calculation for overhead costs that would account for that largest administrative operating cost line? Mr. President and, and Councilor Grout, uh, yes, the city does have an indirect uh, overhead cost rate that we apply um, to different programs depending on the, the nature and the intensity of the program, if you will. For the most part, that's a calculation that's done uh, right before the budget is presented to the council, and and it is basically a a a figure that's uh, calculated based on the services that are being provided, and then it's taken across the top for all departments. It's especially relevant when we have contracts and or grants from outside sources, where, for example, if we get a federal grant or a state grant for a particular program, that. Um, like anyone else, as you might imagine, everyone wants the money just to go, all of it goes to the programs. Uh, but nobody wants to pay the administrators to actually make sure that the program funds are accounted for and, and that the bills are paid and that things are ordered. And so there's got to be some level of that. So, uh, but there is a process for that. And um, 
Ms. Yara in our finance department can certainly give you a, a breakdown of how that number is calculated. Okay, thank you. Yes, I am very excited to receive that. So I, I hope to receive that within the next week or two. And, um, you know, we just we do have issues with our public safety, and, and um, I want to make sure that all of that money is going properly where it needs to be going to see how we can help our businesses and our and then just our neighbors and, and all, because it's, we get these emails all the time, and, and I, I hope we can, think we can do better to help them. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right. So that is my last question. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, that'll end that. Okay, let's move on to the journal. Um, I move approval of the June 21st journal. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Oh, oh, we have to do it by phone, that's right. Um, would you please, clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councilor Grout? Yes. Councilor Lewis? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, folks, next up, uh, we have uh, communications introductions. Are there any changes to our letter of introduction? I'm not aware of any. Seeing none, uh, Madam Vice President. Um, Mr. President, I move approval of the letter of introduction. Second for Councilor Feeblecorn. Councilor will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councilor Grout? Yes. Councilor Lewis? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. That passes unanimously. And as the none of our committees met last month, there are no reports of committees. We move on to deferrals and withdrawals. Do we have any additional deferrals or withdrawals this evening? I'm not aware of any. Seeing none, moving on. Our consent agenda, uh, thank you to the administration staff and our staff for pulling all these items together over the break to be sure we can keep things moving. Are there any changes to our consent agenda? Councilor Pena. I'd like to take um, EC 23-316 off of the consent. I'm sorry, Councilor, 316-316? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilor Pena removes that item. Anything else? Let me mention and say thank you to those of you who have uh, volunteered to serve on uh, city board or commissions. Uh, if your confirmation is up on the consent agenda, we thank you for your willingness to serve as always and look forward to hearing from you soon. Madam Vice President, do you have a motion? Mr. President, I move approval of the consent agenda. I have a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councillor Grout? Yes. Councillor Lewis? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Mm -hmm. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Passes unanimously. Councillor Pena, you had pulled item 23316, which is the mayor's appointment of Lindsay Frome. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, so I want to just thank Ms. Lindsay Frome for um, wanting to serve on the Albuquerque Museum Board of Trustees. This isn't real necessarily related to, to her appointment or pending appointment. I just want to say that, you know, as we get these consent agendas and, you know, everybody and their willingness to serve is just awesome that people are really willing to take the time out of their day to serve on our boards and commissions. But I would just like to ask the administration, as we're filling these boards and having these conversations, especially at large, because I know councilors can pick whoever they want from, from their districts to, to serve, I'd just like to say, working with the Office of Equity and Inclusion, you know, many of our boards still, um, we pass that resolution and our boards still kind of don't reflect our community. Um, if you look at some of the ones, not just today, so I don't want to make this one um, the, the target one, but, you know, we only have two, three people serving on our boards and commissions that are people of color, and, and that's just, we just got to really work diligently to, to make that change. So, thank you with that. Um, I would move approval of EC 23. 
316. And we have a second from Councilor Grout. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councilor Grout? Yes. Councilor Lewis? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. <clears throat> Passes unanimously. That matter carries unanimously. Uh, Chair, Councilor Chair's uh, announcements, Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, August 14th at 5 p.m. via Zoom video conference. And, Mr. President, there will be a Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting on Wednesday, August 16th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers, basement level of the Albuquerque Government Center. This will be a hybrid meeting, so for members and for the public, you can come in person or attend via Zoom. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? And seeing none, we're going to move on to our next item. Uh, there are no financial instruments, but we'll move to public comment. Uh, as a reminder, persons of the public, members of the public can provide live comment to our council in person or virtually if you've signed up for public comment per our instructions uh, that were published on our agendas uh, on Friday. Uh, the high points are you have up to two minutes to present, and your comments must be presented to the councilors only um, and through the council president, and any disruptive comment will result in removal from the meeting. Copies of our rules have been available to the folks to, to view, and uh, if we have a violation or if we have an issue, we'll take a pause uh, and address those as we go forward. There is a two-minute time limit, and a bell will ring to indicate your time is up. For those of you joining us, uh, and I think we only have one Zoom participant this evening, and, and she hasn't joined us yet, uh, if we get there, uh, we'll address that. Um, and so at this point, I'll ask uh, Mr. Cornelius, will you please take us through our public commenters? And I, I will say, if Mr. Cornelius calls you, come on down. If you're on deck, come on down. Take one of those first seats in the front um, so we can get you, uh, slide you right in. Mr. Cornelius. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker tonight is Francesco Artist, followed by Susan Johnston. Francesco, it's nice to see you back and good to talk to you earlier. Thank you, thank you. Uh, real quick housekeeping note, uh, as with previous meetings before the break, the audio and the video don't sync up and it's really annoying trying to follow along. It's like a Godzilla movie, you know, and it's just like the lips move, but the sound does its own thing. Maybe well, it could which be- Which character do I get? <laughs> uh, we'll work on that. Thank, thank you, you uh, thank Mr. you. Cornelius. May I please rec- Guru, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, excuse me, guys, sorry, sorry. Can I please, thank you. Uh, Council President, Madam Vice President, City Councilors, there's many things that I love about District 9, one of which is Street Cat Hub. Director Laura Heaton, with her amazing staff and volunteers, provide free spade and neuter services for our community, free of charge. But none of that could happen if it wasn't for all of you guys. Amazing that on behalf of our furry friends and neighbors who don't have a lone home. Thank you for your generous support, unanimously watching out for those who have no one to watch out for them. I was able to trap and release 12 cats in the past two years, currently living their best life before <laughs> I came along. But those 12 may not seem like a lot, but by now, it would have been in the hundreds and in the thousands in the not too distant future. Sadly, Cat Hub, as we speak, is currently closed because their funding has dried up. As they wait for the next fiscal year to start up, don't quote me on this, I think it's possibly late, fall, uh, late summer, early fall. Maybe someone could shake the piggy bank and find some way to bridge that gap so the wonderful people at Cat Hub can continue to do their amazing and selfless work for our community. And in conclusion, Mr. President, thank you for your willingness to serve. City Council is not going to be the same without you. Well, that, that, you may, be, that may be the intent for some folks. But. <laughs> well, you. wishing you all the best and much success in the next chapter of whatever you choose to do. Uh, it's a thankless job. There's some people who still consider city council as a part-time gig, and it's far from that. It's 24-7 coming at you. It's a thankless job, but you do it. So thank you, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. It's good to see you, and uh, I, bet, I bet we get to see each other again before we're done. Too. Looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Susan Johnston, followed by I Julie. Think Council people I just had a quick follow-up question. You're talking about Street Cat Hub, yes, right? Um, and can you just email me? Um, I will work with that. I mean, yeah, it should be it, it should be a continual um, funding, and I know they probably just did more than they could on on spay and neuters um, for the TNR program. But please email me details, and I'd be happy to work. Thank with you. Them. And they're right across the street from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I think that in this fiscal year that just started, there should be $350,000 for Street Cat Hub. Is that not something that we can make sure is it should be open now versus maybe later next summer we might have to figure out and shake piggy banks? But uh, do we have any idea about that or what the, what the gap is? Mr. President and uh, Councilors and uh, Councilor Bassan, uh, let me talk to uh, to our folks and see if we can't also, uh, you're right, there is some funding in that budget, and let us see. Um, it may be that that because of the lag of the uh, end of the year closeout at the end of June that maybe they are getting ramped up, but let me find out for you, and we'll get that to you. Thanks, Richard. Councilor Payne. And I should have said something about this, so yeah. thank you, Francesco. Uh -oh. um, I know that you, I think the first one you did was of Councillor Sanchez. This looks just like Councillor Grout, and it's her district in the back. So I appreciate it. I know you said as the year went by, you were going to start bringing in the different ones. So thank you. I appreciate it. They're she looks amazing. Cool. So when you do mine, make sure you get rid of all my wrinkles, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Nice to Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Coordinator. Thank you. Susan Johnston, followed by Julie Dreike. Good evening, Mr. President, Madam Vice President. My name is Susan Johnston. I live in District 7. I live on Mars Road, uh, 87107. Luking North Park is located within our neighborhood. There's a vacant area owned by the city west of the park and adjacent to the North Diversion Channel Arroyo. This vacant area is sloped down and is not visible from the street. Our neighborhood experiences numerous problems throughout the year arising from this vacant area, including homeless encampments, violent crime, sex trafficking, and air quality issues arising from open fires set at the encampments. We've been in contact with the city for several years regarding these items. Recently, the city proposed building a dog bark in the vacant area, which is not visible from the street. We applaud the city for proposing to take some action. However, our neighborhood, because of the location and because it is not visible from the street, and because this is where most of the homeless and violent crime and sex trafficking is occurring, do not want a dog park there. It will simply segregated even further for this situation. We created an, a, a, position, a petition in opposition to the dog park. 43 out of 50 of our homeowners signed that petition. We met on July 26 with Mr. David Flores, Deputy Director of Parks and Recreation, regarding the proposed dog park. At this time, we presented Mr. Flores with the petition and discussed the reasons we oppose it. There is only one point of ingress and egress into our neighborhood. It's a dead-end neighborhood. We cannot handle additional traffic. Also, Mr. Flores said there will be no additional parking. We have only street parking. The hours of the operation, am I to finish or no? Go ahead, finish your thought there. All right. We have to wrap up. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, let me then go to this last point. During our meeting, Mr. Flores voiced his opposition to the dog park. We voiced our opposition, and Mr. Flores responded, it would be too expensive and effectively told our neighborhood if we did not allow the dog park, there would be no solutions to address our neighborhood problems. Thank you, ma'am. We'll ask you if you could send the rest of those comments by writing if you'd like, and we'd share them with our staff. Thank you. Have a good evening. Julie Dreike, followed by Simon Polakowski. Good evening, Council President and members. I have um, pictures that I wanted to share that I understand um, is working, maybe. Okay. 
These are pictures from our national night out this past Tuesday. It was a combined national night out between Embudo Canyon and Vista Del Mundo neighborhood associations. Um, this is not unique, nor is it infrequent. It re represents the volunteer work of neighborhood associations throughout our community. It represents the good work of neighborhood volunteers to build community. Thank you, Councillor Grout, for being at our celebration. The Shriner Band pictured um, is the second year that they've provided music at the event. Teen girls have a lemonade stand and a bake sale each year, and they select a charity to donate the funds to. This year, they donated the funds to the Children's Cancer Fund of New Mexico. We partnered with the Los Alam, excuse me, the um, Lomas Tramway Library to promote the summer reading program and provided gift cards to drawings for each of the five categories of um, our neighbors participating. They didn't have to be in our neighborhood to participate, but that's, so we did the drawing for those five categories to support the summer reading program. We also had um, the program Read with the Dog with us that evening as well to promote kids reading again to um, dogs in the community. Um, I'm pleased to share another example of neighborhoods in the community. This is in addition to the policy work that I know that you're all aware of. It's the grassroots efforts that strengthen social ties. It doesn't happen without caring neighbors working together. Thank you to the neighborhood associations throughout our community. And I ask the city council to remember the work of neighborhood association and consider their input on policy issues. Thank you very much. Simon Polakowski, followed by Tad Nimitsky. Let's see if we can see you. Uh, yes, Council President, uh, Vice President. It will be three years ago this August that uh, Roy Caton Jr. was brutally murdered in his home on Harvard, next door to the Peace and Justice Center. And I just wanted to make that public. Uh, Roy, I was a neighbor of Roy's, a one-time student, and a customer, and uh, I did work for him. I don't want Roy to be forgotten. Uh, I don't know how his case has progressed. Uh, I know that our police department is overwhelmed with crime issues. So I'm just putting this out there for the public. If anybody has any information, about this terrible crime, please help in solving it. Thank you for that. Uh, now, um, I noticed, I heard that we have 9,000 cameras that are in time. I used to do public access, and public access can't do live television. Uh, I find that uh, rather interesting. Uh, you know, the police can observe the city from 9,000 cameras. We can't have uh, a studio dedicated to live public access for the community of Albuquerque, where people can do current events, things like, maybe if I had a pub, uh, public access show once a week, I would mention uh, Roy's tragic demise. Uh, you know, I don't, I believe in public access television. I believe in, you know, that everybody should have a podium to voice what is their concerns about the community, uh, good and bad and so on. I find it tragic that uh, we don't have that. But we do have 9,000 <laughs> presently cameras, live TV for the police. I, I, you know, there's a tremendous amount of money that's generated by uh, fees from cable TV. Let's put them to good use for the public so we can help our community be a better place. Thank you. Ted Nemitsky, followed by Andrea Calderon. Thank you. My name is Ted Nemitsky. Well, what got, got my attention, my, um, community center, the Manzano Mesa Community Center. Well, last, last week, Friday, I went over there. I had to wait. I got it five after eight. I have to wait half an hour in the line to get ticket, pay for breakfast. Now I noticed last Friday, this time I went early. I still have to wait before eight o'clock. 
all women with kids walking inside before 8 o'clock. Here is seniors, 80, some of them 90, with disability, outside standing. How you like that? Isn't that disgusting? Isn't that disgusting? Non-human to some people crippled with crutches or walker standing outside. The, and door were open for the kids. Something not right. And I still have to wait. So now another thing caught my attention. Well, here is changes. Some agenda from final was moved into consent agenda. Why? I know to keep public from this agenda. And that's violating open meeting act and others. Thank you. And I will sue. Mr. President. Uh, uh, Mr. Naminsky. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, Mr. Naminsky, I'm I'm wondering if what you're what you're uh, referring to that was moved to consent was Councillor Sanchez's tip line bill. Is that the one you're talking about? Uh, it, that's been several bills. In fact, here I just went to. I can get a response from City Council office. So I filed four different requests okay. and, uh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure that, at least on that one, because I also was unaware of the change until, you know, earlier, and, but And, and I filed a uh, request for last year uh, I to, to produce consent and agenda. At so I am collecting evidence. Okay, and at least on this one, I just want to say that I saw that Councillor Sanchez consented to withdraw the bill, so it wasn't going to come up. And from so final, I, shifted to it, consent. It, it's not consent to approve; it's withdrawn. So we're not going to hear that bill at all. Well, that's for several before okay. it was approved. Well, at least on that one, I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Andrea Calderon, followed by Scott White. Hi, welcome back, Council. Good to see you. Um, I've got uh, one sort of serious comment and then two more lighthearted ones. Um, I'll, I'll just start by saying that I'm, I'm one of three uh, people of color on the Indicators Progress Commission. I'm really excited about um, increasing the, the diversity in other commissions. So thank you, um, Councilor Pena, on that. Um, so the serious notes, I guess, is um, about this concept of a displacement risk index. Um, we as a city can't measure development pressures right now. So when we talk about things like the rail yards or the rail trail or other development efforts that we're seeing around town, there's really no way for us to assess the impacts um, of development on legacy residents, on home ownership rates, on diversity and increasing um, access to really uh, high quality neighborhoods for residents that have been there for a long time. Um, further, I, I think that such a tool would give leaders, um, city leaders internally and advocates externally a tool for de determining and having a more nuanced approach um, towards gentrification. Is it actually happening? Is it not happening? Nobody can tell because we don't have a way of measuring it. Um, so just pushing that. Um, and I would say that the, goal, the assessment is with the goal of displacement prevention and that it should also be looked at in terms of increasing investments to keep residents in place. So you don't measure something just for the sake of measuring, you, you measure something for the sake of creating interventions, right? So that's what we're moving towards. Um, okay, so on to my um, more lighthearted comments. Um, <laughs> I have a dog, her name is Lisa Marie. Um, and she really appreciates the uh, changes that have happened to the Rio Grande Triangle Dog Park. Um, so I want to thank Director Simon. Um, Lisa and I have had a much uh, a warmer experience there. Um, really excited to see more trees in place and um, vegetation, so appreciate, appreciate that. And I will say that over um, the recess, oops, okay, thank you. I had the opportunity to go to Silverton, Silverton, Colorado for the 4th of July as a part of a trip. 
And um, Council Member Sanchez, I think you'll appreciate that I saw a lowrider Jeep <laughs> <laughs> at the 4th of July celebration. Um, just thought that would be a, that's a good way to bridge the two worlds. So anyways, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Caldwell. <laughs> I don't think you meant to say that. Uh, up next is Scott White, followed by Tim Woodhull. Tim Woodhull. Thank you, Mr. Chair, City Council, and uh, Michelle and administrative staff for allowing me a few minutes to speak to you. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to make a, a recommendation and for recognition for four of your, your staff members that uh, I'd like to read this. Uh, I enjoy and need the city of Albuquerque paratransit transportation services supervised by Mr. Thomas Martinez of the Department of Senior Affairs. This most needed service for senior citizens was developed by you, the city council, for senior citizens for all medical appointments and services to assist in our monthly financial transportation needs, food purchase, <clears throat> and social transportation needs. For the past three years, the deadly virus has attacked numerous people, leading to death to many New Mexicans in our state of New Mexico. The deadly virus still exists and is raising its head again, attacking and killing people. Under our governor city and city council direction, employees of state government and employees city of the Albuquerque government went to work providing state safe environments for all citizens that they serve. This letter is about sit for city employees who went over and beyond their required job duties to protect and provide safe environment for senior, senior citizens that they serve eight hours a day and five days a week for the past three years and are still providing the excellent service to senior citizens. The senior service also is doing a good job uh, providing services to other people. These four city Albuquerque employees are Mr. Thomas Martinez, paratransit supervisor, Mr. Leo Santalens, and Ms. Annette Ms. Montoya, and Mr. Jarvis Sanchez of the transportation drivers. These four <clears throat> transit drivers would scrub their transportation vans down nightly, spray the vans with virus germ killers and wash all the seats and handrails. Mr. Jarvis will go down on his hands and knees and scrub the whole transportation van down every day. These four individuals will use their own money to wash their transportation vans, cost them about eight or $10 a wash. These four city employees did not take time off from work for the past three years <clears throat> and the higher power watched over them and their families. These four city employees deserve superior recognition, rewarded, compensated for the excellent service and their job duties they performed. I ask of you today, we should not overlook city employees that c care about the people, perform their job duties in superior fashion and risk their well-being and their families to keep senior citizens safe from this deadly virus. All I can say, and many senior citizens can say is thank you for their excellent character and their ex exceptional values 
they exhibited in keeping us senior citizens safe and alive during the deadly virus time. I submitted the same letter and request to play it forward, but for whatever reason, it was not considered. Thank you very much. Mr. Woodhull, thank you for making time to come down and do that. We need to do more to recommend and, and commend our city uh, employees that go above and beyond. And you provided us with a copy of your comments yes, tonight. Yes, you all have one. Give those to the administration um, and so that their bosses can hey, put that in their personnel file from you and be sure that they know that you had a time, made time to do that. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. President. I'm sorry, Councillor Payne, I missed it. Um, and Mr. Rayal, we were doing, um, we had passed a resolution a few years ago about all the departments, um, you know, um, recognizing uh, staff that go above and beyond and the departments where we did do it. I think we're doing it here once a month. So if we can kind of figure out who was doing that and initiate that program once again, and I mean, we could start with this, but yeah, I think it's important to recognize those who go above and beyond. Well, Mr. President, I'm here every month. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I will certainly do that. Okay, for, thank for you. Sure. Thank you. Great. Mr. Uh, Bernays. Um, Mr. President, our loan sign up on Zoom is not present at this time, so that does conclude general public comment. Thank you all for making time for those comments. And we're going to move on to our action items this evening. Um, our first item up is an appeal. I was waiting on Ms. Franquillo. Thank you. Uh, AC 2310. AC 2310 uh, involves Diana Dorn Jones, an agent for Johnny and uh, Nova Dorn, that appeals uh, the EPC's decision to approve a zone map amendment um, at 1102 Edith Boulevard Southeast. I'm not going to read the rest of it because Ms. Franquillo is going to tell us all about it. And it's in the record. And then we're going to see what we do from there. Ms. Franquillo. Thank you, Mr. President and Counselors. Uh, this is an appeal of the EPC's approval of a zone change at 1102 Edith Boulevard from R1A to RML. The property owner requested the zone change because there is a triplex on the property, which they discovered is a non-conforming use in the R1A zone. The change to RML will make the triplex a permissive use and eliminate the non-conformity uh, at the site. For background, this triplex has existed on the property since about 1967, so approximately 56 years. When the IDO was adopted, the property received an R1A zoning designation, which is single family. So the triplex, a multifamily use, became a non-conforming use. To correct this, the current owners applied to the EPC for a zone change to RML, which is residential multifamily low density, which was unanimously approved by the EPC and that decision was appealed by a neighbor to the property. The land use hearing officer recommends that the council deny this appeal and uphold the EPC's decision to approve the zone change uh, because the EPC's decisions and findings are rational, reasonable, and supported by the facts in the record, and the decision complies with the IDO and the comp plan. The LUHO also found that the appellants did not satisfy their burden of proof of supporting their appeal because they didn't present specific evidence as to how or why the EPC's approval was in error. Uh, just to touch on the appellant's primary claims, one, the appellants claim that the zone change creates spot zoning that uh, would allow more intense uses in the area. The LUHO found that spot zones are not on their face unlawful, incompatible, or violate the comp plan, and that any more intense uses are mitigated by the fact that there was unrefuted evidence in the record that the owner plans to keep the triplex as is, um, and given the size of this lot, most of the more intense permissible uses on the site would not be feasible. Uh, but, but to the extent they are, um, use-specific standards in the IDO would also mitigate potential adverse impacts. Two, the appellants claim that the zone change was requested for improper economic reasons because under the IDO, economic reasons cannot be the predominant reason to support a zone change request. The LUHO acknowledged that financing was a component of the request. Um, the owner was trying to get some additional funding to do work to imp improve the triplex, uh, but this was not the primary reason used to support the request. Um, instead, the predominant reason for the zone change is to correct the nonconformance and to allow for separate addresses for the triplex, which is actually how the owners discovered the nonconformance in the first place when they went to the post office and tried to get separate addresses. Um, again, the LUHO concluded that the EPC's approval of the zone change was well supported 
and the appellants did not meet their burden of proof in challenging the EPC's decision. So the LUHO recommends denial of the appeal and upholding the EPC's approval of the zone change. Um, and this is an accept or reject, so we'll not hear from the parties tonight. Um, instead, council's options are to accept the LUHO's recommendations and findings, accept and adopt different findings, or reject the LUHO's recommendation, in which case we will um, have a full hearing on this at our next city council meeting. Okay, and councilors, before we get, uh, well, let's just go to questions. I know Councilor Benton has a uh, has a motion, but Councilor Payne, do you have a question before we go to that? Or do before you? we go to the motion? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to, yes, Mr. President, thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, um, I was going to go by your last name, um, your Ronkeo. previous last name. <laughs> um, um, Ronkeo is, um, so they were non-conforming to begin with, but they were having, they were utilizing it for multifamily. So was the community upset about that? Were there, were there issues related to that in the past? And now that the new owners purchased it, they want to actually, um, even though it was non-conforming, they want to, since there was precedence, they want to actually um, make it with three units? Is that correct? Mr. Or President, Council. Family, I'm sorry. Mr. President, Councilor Pena. So uh, the triplex existed um, prior to since 1967, at least. Um, and following adoption of the IDO, that parcel received a single family zoning designation and became non conforming at that time. Um, it sort of, I think, flew under the radar for most folks um, up until recently when this new owner, like I said, was, was doing work on the property. and. Um, discovered that discrepancy in the zoning versus the use. Okay. Um, Mr. President, so I know um, Councilor Benton has a motion. I don't know if it's, but my motion would be, I'm not making the motion currently because I don't know what his motion is, but it would be to reject the LUHO recommendation. Thank you, Councilor. And Councilor Benton had his hand up first, so I'm going to take his first, and it's in his district as well. So, Councilor Benton, do you have a motion, or you want to start a question, and we'll we'll come back and do that at the end? I do have a motion. We'll just go ahead and put it forward for consideration. I move that we accept the LUHO's findings and recommendations. And for the purposes of debate, Councilor Bassan has seconded it. We know there may be a competing motion if this fails, so we'll move that debate forward. Councilor Benton, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. President, um, you know this is this is a, a longstanding use on this location, as far as uh, we can see. This seems to have been, from what I know of the IDO, a, a reasonable approach to solving it, which, which would be to, uh, uh, to do the zone change. Normally, these would be considered a spot zone. And I know that that was one of the arguments, but spot zones are allowed. They're not disallowed carte blanche. They are allowed uh, depending on the circumstances. And this to me seems to be one of them. That's my rationale. Uh, Councilor Bassan, then I'll recognize myself. We'll go back and see where this goes. Go ahead. Mr. President, uh, Ms. Ronquillo, I, now I almost did mm -hmm. it. Ms. Ronquillo, did you say that also, and it's probably not quite relevant, but yet to me, I did find that it was an interesting uh, nugget of information too that the property owner did try to go through the one other potential accept acceptable way and manner in which to make sure to rectify something that's existed for 60 some years. And then the, in my opinion, lovely IDO ended up causing a problem about. Um, but did, isn't there another method that they went through that wasn't feasible? Uh, yes, Mr. President, Councilor Bassan. Uh, the homeowners did try to go through the process of obtaining a zoning certification uh, where the city recognizes that historically that parcel has operated in a non-conforming way. Um, unfortunately, the owners were not able to provide enough historical documentation to, to go through that process. And so they were actually instructed uh, by the city to instead pursue a zone change. Mr. President, so Ms. Ronquillo, this property has existed for decades. It's not that it's the a new triplex. It's that this is how it's always been. They just want to do whatever it is they want to do with it, not necessarily start something brand new. Mr. President, Councilor Bassan, that's correct. This has existed as is for over 50 years. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ronquillo, uh, just remind me, it's been, I have 
PTSD from IDO hearings, but there was a point after we passed the first IDO where we allowed folks to sort of come in and take those special use or non-conforming uses, et cetera. And we had an open, for lack of a better term, like an open forum. You could kind of walk in, work on with somebody on that, and try to do that as a big batch. But a lot of folks that weren't, we've sort of discovered over time through these hearings, some folks didn't know that was an option. They didn't even know they were non-conforming until they, in this case, is my understanding in the record, they sell the property and the new owner needs some paperwork for the bank or they need to do some upgrades and they need to try to get a building permit and they find out that the underlying use is no longer conforming, they got to do all this. Um, but, I mean, obviously we don't know what would have happened in the past had the prior owner tried to go through that process, but almost all of the, as I recall, the vast majority of the sort of grandfathered in uses this council approved when the new IDO came into place for those non-conformings. Is that correct? Mr. President, I cannot speak to practice for um, prior zone conversion since I was not here at that time. Um, but it is um, noted in the record of the LUHO hearing that uh, those processes did take place and were generally um, approved by the council. Um, the LUHO also did ask planning staff if this had come in um, during that time what the what the zone change would have been to and if the RML um, would have been the outcome. And um, he prefaced that by saying this is speculative, but um, planning staff did say that it's likely that this would have been the zone change that resulted. Yeah, I, I sort of think based on the record, I will say just as sort of an editorial point, um, in reading the record, reviewing the record, and our staff had sort of pointed this out as well, I just want to be careful. I think the LUHO sort of went into some line of questioning in here that it probably was outside the scope of sort of the strict bounds of what I think they should be asking, like, hey, what are you going to do with this in the future as kind of a way of determining whether this would be approved. I don't think the LUHO would have used that as a condition, but I think it opened the door um, to invite, like, community folks to, to sort of speculate that perhaps they would be able to challenge a future use. And that's just not the, that's not what this is about in this case. It's really about grandfathering somebody in or not. And I'm not even sure what happens to that owner if we say no. Um, so I, I I'm inclined, like, I, I have a little bit of heartburn with sort of the narrative that, that I think came out of those hearings because of the way the questions were formed and allowed, the testimony that was allowed, but at the core of it to me is that this is a grandfathered use. It's been around since long before I was around. Um, and to Councilor Pena's uh, sort of point, like, no one seems to have had an issue with this before, after, or since. It's merely trying to clean this up um, so that the new owner can properly care for their property. And quite frankly, we need folks with housing to do that. Um, it seems to have been a compatible use in the neighborhood. And so I, I would have no issue uh, supporting the Councilor Benton's motion to accept this. Um, but there may be some competing views. So that's my cue to open it up, and Councilor Payne, you may have one. Thank you. I, I'll defer to anyone else first. Or? Nope. I think you have the last question, then we'll go to Councilor Benton. We'll close. Okay. Well, I can support Councilor Benton's. I read, I read the record as well, and I seen some of those questions in there that it was kind of like, if, is it going to be, you know, something beneficial that shouldn't be part of the conversation? And as we talk about it being grandfathered in, it was never grandfathered in, right? They were non-conforming this entire time. So I want to be clear that when we talk about them being grandfathered, it wasn't. And the community overwhelmingly stated that they didn't want to have, um, you know, the duplex with the casita, and this is kind of really creating that multifamily in a um, residential area where it's just the single family homes. And you know, in, in my neighborhood, and I'm sure other neighborhoods, there are houses that are like that that we have concerns about because they have converted them, and they're not grandfathered, they just converted them. And they were non-conforming, they never were conforming, and these are um, issues that, you know, it like, it like in um, other neighborhoods where you have these uses that people are doing it over the, the, the over time, it doesn't necessarily mean that the community is embracing that that use of that property. So, um, and for some of the reasons that you stated about some of the questions that were asked there, I think it's really this isn't to know. It's just going back to Luho and having them really take a deeper dive and look at this better. Seeing no other questions or discussion, we'll go back to Councilor Benton for any uh, further discussion or a close on the motion to accept the LUHO recommendations. And of course, if that fails, we'll go and open up for other recommendations. Councilor Benton, anything? Yeah, I, I, I thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't really have anything more to add. I think the, the record shows that this is a long-standing non-conforming use. And um, 
So in that type of situation, we don't know the entire history of, of this property, how it came to be that use, you know, uh, to, to include uh, multiple dwelling units on the same property. Um, but, uh, but it would seem that the, it, it, in fairness to the property owner, to be able to continue what's been there for a long, long time, to suddenly say, well, the, the community doesn't like your use of that property. They may, they may or may not, but it's been in existence for a long time. And this is a way to, to um, get it on the records, properly on the records, and uh, um, just seemed like a reasonable approach. And it was what was recommended to them by the planning department. So. I, I don't have any other argument. Thank you, sir. Seeing no other discussion, we'll ask the clerk to call the vote on the motion to accept the Lujo recommendations and findings. Councilor Busson. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. No. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. No. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. That passes on a six to two vote. That matter passes on a six to two. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Councilors, next up we have item 13 for approvals. There are none this evening. Our last item on the agenda this evening is a final action by Councilor Pena, R 148. Councilor, cheers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, R-148 is declaring the city's intent to collaborate with Bernalillo County to revitalize Sunset Road and Isleta Boulevard from Central to Isleta Pueblo. Um, I announced earlier that we were at an announcement for grant opportunities for signage along West Central. And as you know, um, we have the longest urban stretch of the historic road, and we have the only place in the nation where it actually crosses itself, which is... Um, um, also part of the Camino Real. And anyway, um, lots of it is city and county, and so I think uh, the county may have already passed this resolution. I'm not sure if it's already passed, sir, but we had um, uh, same resolutions moving forward, and this is really just to say, hey, we need to look at how we can use those same opportunities that we're using on Route 66 to help to revitalize and get ready for the 100th year celebration coming up in 2026. So with that, I would urge your support. And with a second from Councilor Rassan. Uh, our speaker this evening uh, declined to participate or withdrew from his comments. And so is there any comment from the administration? Mr. Real says thumbs up. Great. Any questions from the council? Going once, going twice, seeing none. Will the clerk please call the vote? Councilor Rassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Oh, yes. Councilor Pena. <laughs> Councilor Pena. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Well, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. We eased you in the back from break pretty lightly tonight. Don't get used to it. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks. <laughs>